What happened to you and your enjoyment of films? God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast, I guess. This, this podcast mostly. This is all you're doing. <laughs> Once again, we are here. What is this? Am I stuck in my chair all the time or what the f- I, I guess neither one of us just have any goddamn life. Well, that is me, the lifeless Garri, your host. My co-host is Henrik. Also lifeless. Great minds think alike. I, 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 I've heard really nice things about this thing called sex, and I would really like to try it one day. <laughs> But uh, uh, until then, you, we, we and the listeners are stuck with us. I just got for a second podcast. Well, as good testosterone-filled no-life beings, it's time to hunt. And welcome back to South Korea's cinema, which we can't get rid of. You can't shake it off. Because, well, it is one of the biggest out there, so don't get me started, Henrik. And, and most likely we also have some kind of a... Very limited worldview when it comes to actually world languages. Because first we were stuck with what, what French and Italian for God knows how long, and then we switched <coughs> to Slavic. And now it's once again, it's it's South Korean Asian language tree, so... Where do you want where... us to go? Namibia or something? Well, Namibia would actually be be a, an actual change on the podcast, finally. I'll keep that in mind. I'll see what I can do for next I mean, week. we haven't touched upon... Uruguayan cinema. Is that a joke? No, no, no. It's it's a fact. We haven't done it. And <laughs> and where 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 is the love for the Cuban filmmakers? Hmm. You make very good points. I, I'm I'm just asking. Well, well, well. Yeah, I I was about to get to it. We haven't gone to Latin America really, like ever. So <laughs> yeah, un- <laughs> unfortunately not. <clears throat> Time to fix that soon. Yeah, yeah. Then again, then again, you know, in our defense, we shouldn't just, you know, for, force ourselves and forcibly push ourselves into visiting films from different countries, because usually yeah. that just ends up backfiring in your goddamn face. It already backfired us when we... In, in the goddamn International Cinema Challenge, which was absolute cancer. Yes. Okay, dear listeners worldwide, please wait for a pizza delivery from Jan. <laughs> Just wait a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, in this podcast, which is mostly of, of curry munching on a pizza. <laughs> Actually, more like sushi nowadays. Well, it's quite expensive. Well, well a, 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 anyways, anyways, as a, as the name of the podcast, the Flick Lab. Already gives it out. This is mostly, if not mainly, just a food podcast. <laughs> yeah. It's the food that keeps me ticking here. Yeah, I, ca- I can remember when we, when we started this shit and it was the booze that got, uh, kept us ticking. What happened to that format? Maybe I I, might I guess be... my liver. Oh. No, no, what, what happened? What what happened to the booze format was the goddamn Halloween marathon and the American beer. Yeah, I remember Miller. I actually... Yeah, fucking Miller. <laughs> Miller happened. <laughs> I actually kind of like that. It was kind of like... Corona, which has um, <laughs> interesting connotations nowadays that work. Tonight's film, we go hunting. Not for food. It's uh, Sanyang is Sigan. Sanyang is Sigan, more or less in Korean. It means the exact same thing. Time to hunt, Henrik. And the question is, hunt what exactly? People. Well, there, there is, there's just one hunter in the entire film. Who hunts several people. What is so goddamn hard to kind of grasp about that concept? Well, but basically, the, the concept itself. Well, <clears throat> this is the kind of film podcast where we do delve very deep into films. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, unfortunately. The like, fucking webpage! Uh, oh, yeah, that, that one, man. Theflicklab.com. Siellä se asunto on. 
<laughs> that is our homepage. And you can easily find all the episodes there. In case you do not, for some reason, use a podcast player for listening to podcasts. You can also go to YouTube to do this heretic stuff. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you can go to the video platform to listen to, to a film podcast. Yeah, whatever floats your boat. I don't discriminate. Yeah. Why are we watching this film tonight? Well, we're watching this film tonight because it's a new movie. It's on Netflix. It's easy to access. And we haven't touched on any Netflix film so there's a lot of firsts here first netflix movie for us in this podcast and uh first heist film and here i was certain that the reason why we are watching the film is because you checked out the parasite and you really liked parasite and this film actually shares an actor with parasite that's one thing that's one thing we're kind of riding on the waves we watched parasite and uh following on the footsteps of the South Korean takeover of the world, or at least Netflix, which has bought a lot of rights for different new TV series or movies from South Korea. So let's look at this phenomenon. It's, it's almost like South Korea these days really wants to storm Netflix. So they try to produce as much of middle budget tier content, film and TV, just so that it's, it would be more cheaper for Netflix to buy those properties, and this way South Korea, uh, also maybe Japan, would get a larger w- foothold on Netflix's library. Well, fortunately, we're looking at a very high quality level movie tonight, but unfortunately this film was suffering from this friend of ours, COVID-19. The film was supposed to be pushed out on February 26th in theaters, but it wasn't, and it was delayed in the far future, but then it was informed that Netflix would get the uh, exclusive distribution rights worldwide. The film first premiered at the 70th Berlin International Film Festival on February 22nd, 2020, and it was the first Korean film in the festival's history. So it was delayed due to corona, and then they wanted to release it on Netflix, and a release date was provided, and then again it was postponed because Constant Panda filed an injunction against the distributor Little Big Pictures as they felt they got fucked over. Furthermore, there was a quote, none of the overseas distributors agreed on an exclusive distribution agreement with Netflix. So Netflix had to comply with Seoul Central District Court ruling regarding the distribution contracts, and the film was set on ice. But only a week later, Henrik, April 16th, Netflix informed that the compensation deal had been reached with the parties involved. The film was then released on Netflix on the 23rd of April. Tonight's director is Yoon Sung Hyun. He won the world's hearts with the movie Pasukun, also known as Bleak Night. This was Yoon's first feature film. Time to Hunt is his second feature film. The... Aforementioned Pasukun was a 2010 South Korean coming-of-age drama which he wrote and directed, and it received very, very favorable reviews. This is about a father who is looking for answers in his life following the death of his son. And there, the son was played by Lee Jae-hun, who of course plays the lead gangster Jun Sok in Time to Hunt. Principal photography began for this film on January 2018, Filming was completed on July 15, 2018, so it's kind of a old material that we are already looking at now. Filming mostly took place in Incheon. Anything else to add, or should it be scene by scene? No, let's just get to the scene by scene. Finally. Or actually quite fast this time. We start with an establishing scene. As it happens usually in these films, they start to first establish. So what a surprise. The poorness of the neighborhood is established with uh, the certain dialogue, quote, How would you do that? I know a guy exports vintage clothes. We'll sell them overseas through him. And so th- this is not very exciting for Gihun because uh, he would want to get something more exciting, something that gets him more money. But uh, the character that he calls Fatso, Chang Ho, gets scolded for using his friend's clothes mainly only. Yeah, it's kind of a running gag throughout the film. It is. Guy keeps doing that. Even underwear. What's wrong with you? Anyway, dystopian Korea is established here. The camera pans around the street corners. And thereby, after introducing these two characters, we get the title card. And product placement. LG Think 
is all over, or at least in two or three scenes. We get a lot of protest shots throughout the film. Here's one riot police, wall graffitis, emptiness of the streets is something very prevalent. Well, yeah, it, it is actually like emptiness of, of places is really prevalent throughout the film to a point where I'm actually looking at the film and I'm questioning, is that you, my old friend, the budget? And the budget goes, yeah, most likely that was me. Or not. Because it takes a hell of a lot of budget to clear out those people away. <laughs> I don't know. Then, then again, when, when I look at the film, what, what I see is actually pretty cheap filmmaking. When it comes to the locations and also the surprisingly empty spaces and the lack of crowds, even though this is supposed to be a nationwide uh, or a countrywide kind of a problem that they are dealing with. <sighs> So, so you're saying that this is somehow surprising that, you know, we have a dystopian South Korea where people have one that is basically worthless and people are not on the streets buying things. Yeah, boo hoo hoo. Of course they are not buying I'm, things. I, I'm, I'm saying that we are supposed to have South Korea, which is a major city of billions of people. And then, then you see the large crowds of 20 people and the film only takes place in pretty much... Shipping yards, empty building sites, but pretty much, you know, areas where you can kind of easily believe that these places have someday been something in the real world and now they are just, you know, abandoned. Maybe belonging into to city or, or, or the national government and they are just cheap to rent. Kind of a stunt that, well, American B-movies like to pull off constantly, like... like you know, renting an abandoned school building because you can get that for like 200 bucks and then you just, you know, shoot shoot your film or, or a large number of scenes there. There are really not that many locations in this film. And wh what locations you have are most, most, mostly derelict. As they should be. If people die away, if there's a lot of crime, people leave their houses, everything goes out of order, buildings don't yeah. work. So I don't understand what's your problem with the, like derelict school buildings, well, sub-buildings, well, because... Did, did the people die away? Well, because possibly. Because the film doesn't say that... Well, possibly, yeah, but the film never says that they died away. What? Or, or they moved. We are, we are still talking about a goddamn major country, and it's more barren than goddamn Finland. I mean, what gives South Korea? What the fuck are you expecting? You know, it's a situation where the their coin is not working anymore. They can't buy services. I, They're I, I, staying I, 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 indoors. Some goddamn homeless people on the goddamn streets, man. Well, well maybe they... Homeless. They died. They died. Well, they that the film doesn't establish I that. I just the established that, actually, god damn it. That the film doesn't even establish the financial crisis that they are supposed to face. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it marks on how, how one is worthless and, the, and, and South Korea has hit the financial crisis. But what is the financial crisis that they have hit? Well, that, that, that's, not, that's not important, right? We know. Well, I, I, I was kind of interested, like, what went wrong? Why is... Why is... South Korean economy all of a sudden boo-boo. Things happen. And the film is kind of, kind of just, well, one day economy boo-boo. And that's about that. I I most definitely, when I was watch, checking out the film, I actually wanted to hear more clearly about what is the nature of the economical crisis that they were facing. Like, what? Why it happened? Whatever happened to Venezuela, maybe it's something different. Like, well, something happened well, well, in the government yeah, yeah. level and everything collapsed. Yeah, but that doesn't quite work. Because the, the film is kind of, kind of at odds with itself when it comes to text and, and visual. On a visual level, when it, comes to, when, <coughs> when it comes to the economic crisis aspect of Time to Hunt, on a visual level, the film borrows a lot of visual elements and a lot of visual themes. Yeah, from Terminator, or, or, Terminator or how, to... how it feels on a visual level. It borrows a lot from Detroit. During the time when General Motors left the Flint, Mich Michigan, and closed its factories, leading into a massive in uh, unemployment and, well, basically the rising crime rate and stuff like that. That's what the film says on visual level, but on, on text level, it 
Well, my understanding is, is that it's talking more about hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. And those two aren't exactly the same thing. And, and the poverty could uh, mostly would actually show up uh, on a different levels when, when it's A, the company is going bankrupt and they're just, you know, not being any kind of economical infrastructure anymore. And, and B, when you are just being hit by massive case of hyperinflation. Okay. So which one is it, Gotham? Well, seems like a super massive hyperinflation to me for reason X, which I'm not too interested to delve any deeper than that. Well, but I would have really wanted to know why is hyperinflation and why does it actually look like Detroit after Gen General Motors left the area? <laughs> What? Like, like Why not? You're showing me one thing and you're telling me the, the other. So finally when South and Korea I'm... gets its shit together and they're doing more different kinds of cinema with the more uh, visuals and then you're complaining that, you know, that they're just borrowing things. Yeah, sure, they're borrowing things. Everybody's fucking borrowing things. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't make for a very interesting uh, environment for the film. It kind of means, at, at least in this film's case, to me, it means... I would have wanted to know more sp specifically the nature of economical crisis that South Korea is experiencing in time to hunt work. But you, you know what, Henrik? You're not getting it. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> because because the, the film... I, I, I guess it looked at the dictionary and found the word establishing, and then it was, well, we found it. And that's about it. <sighs> This is a film that actually establishes quite, quite quite well. It takes a little bit long time with it, maybe 20 minutes before it kicks into gear, as South Korean movies it, kind of do. It establishes the characters to a boy, point. Yep. It spends a hell of a lot of time on the characters. and It, it does. Fucking hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can see how the mechanics work. They're clearly there. You can see when the movie is doing something. Here we have establishing this, that the guy is a bit of a fatso and maybe not the smartest pulp in the world. And then you have a Joysik who is willing to follow his friend into this uh, plan, even though they have some history together that they already did some burgling and they shouldn't do it again because, you know, they could get locked up, but they have nothing to lose. And I think that nothing to lose is a pretty good setup because what are you going to do? Then you got to go for it. I would go for what they're doing right here. You don't really have any options, do you? Well, the question kind of is, why would you? In, in, in fact, because uh, actually they do have things to lose. Really? Really? What do they have yeah. to lose anymore? Because they are... I, I, I don't know. I don't know. They're fucking maybe, dying maybe. in their apartments. They can't pay their rent. They don't have money to buy food any, anymore. They have 2,000 USD. What then? Yeah, well, the one dude has parents. Yeah. I mean, is it that something you might want to keep around your family? Yeah. I mean, I, I know, I know, I know. Economy went boo-boo. But what, what, what? Fa family means nothing all of a sudden. Y your own life doesn't mean anything. Well, if the parents went kind of boo-boo as well, well, what's there in keeping these guys to pull off their heist? Okay, if, if, the, if, the, if the parents are delving in money, I don't... Think they are interested in supporting the entire group. Uh, are, are you saying that poor people are worthless? But like, if if your mo parents are financially poor and and can't support, in that case, by all means, you know, perform an armed robbery against mafia and risk risk the fact that your mom and dad gets shot to the head. Well, that's not. I, how I'm it... just 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 asking, you know, in the name of of establishing, <laughs> because somebody has to do it. I'm saying that there is a group of four people, and the four people cannot be supported by a poor family, right? Yeah. And maybe, for, like you said, for Higun, it, it could be kind of a valid point that, you know, they have a well, they have some food, they have clothes still. Or, well, or, or do they really? Because Kihun buys a little bit of a sweater for uh, his mother before they go on. But anyway, if if there was yeah, anyone, yeah, and, if there was anyone uh, who would be benefiting from the the family environment, it would be Gihun himself only. Yeah, yeah. So Gihun has something to lose. He's got their family, and well, the, this is something where where once again the nature of the economic crisis kind of shows up because 
they, they, they establish that there's still brands. Brands are valuable in, in South Korea. So there has to be some kind of export-import with, with brands in order to keep the brands up. Uh, also, the sweater that ki buys for his mom looks pretty new. So I'm, I'm guessing clothing industry does exist still. So people sell clothes. Yes. There are grocery stores. Yeah. So there still is money going around. Of course. People, some people even have so much money that they can go to a gambling den and, and gamble with, with US dollars. What? So ba- basically, they, they are rich and poor and there is some industry still going on in South Korea. Oh, of course there so, is. It's, it's, yeah, it's... So why not start a business? <laughs> why not get a job? Well, you know, asking for a friend, asking for a friend, there are countless of streets with empty buildings that have had once clothing stores, bicycle stores, whatever you have. You can't work in these places because they are shut down. Starting a business under these conditions when you can't even trust the establishment, you can you can trust the police force. You can't. Everything is crumbled to the ground. The IMF is not giving them any more loan for whatever reason. Yeah. So, so you would think that actually property would be pretty cheap at, at this point. Or, or then you could just, you know, I, I don't know, just start a home business. What happened to you on. and you and your enjoyment of films? God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast, I guess. This, this podcast mostly. This is all you're doing. <laughs> all right. So we move into uh, Jun Sok, who is getting released from prison. They're waiting him by the car, and we get to the party, and Junsok has a plan to share. Well, at least the first part of the plan. He will get to the more murkier part of the plan later. Quote, I befriended a guy in jail who smuggles shit in Taiwan, a place called Kenting in southern Taiwan. There's emerald-colored ocean, palm trees, and endless sun. It's just like Hawaii. No, exactly the same. So, if Junsok travels there, the smuggler will help him to settle by touristy operations that he's running. And the smuggler owns operations related to uh, bikes, car rental business, shops, diners, so many businesses. And Yeah, and all legal. All, of course. And uh, But the income here is the main point. It's not about if it's illegal or legal, right? Just as, it, as a... it actually is. It, it is hugely <sighs> important here. Because, because the dude makes $8,000 in in a month through legal business, which means that, you know, the money he makes is actually safe and secure. Mm-hmm. That the government lets you have your 8,000 grand, you ma- your 8 grand you make in a month because you make it the legal way. If you make it through, I don't know, drug trade, in that case, you know, the government is more starting to confiscate your, your, vali- uh, your valuables and your assets, uh, also your money. But they are more relaxed and more letting you keep them if you make them le- the legal way. Which is kind of also asking, if you make eight grand in a month through legal businesses, why do you do the, all this criminal shit? Because you can't get to Taiwan without without robbing the, the, the gambling place. You have to... No, no, no I'm, I'm talking about his friend. The, the Taiwanese friend who he met in prison. Mm. Who has, you know, all, all those tourism businesses going on and makes eight grand in a month? Yeah. Like, why, why, why do you land yourself in a in a in a prison when you can legally make eight eight thousand a month? Well, like, if if I would make eight eight thousand a month, I would I would you know I I would keep doing my legal shit and I would stay out of prison because in prison you can't make eight grand a month. Through legal shit. Well, we don't know if it's illegal or legal shit. It's most well, probably illegal shit. And we're talking well, about well, Taiwan, for fuck's sake. The, 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 God damn it, God damn it. The dude makes a case that that, that his Taiwanese friend owns, like, so many businesses, huh? as he says it, and makes eight, eight grand a month. Like, that hints very clearly that he makes eight grand in Taiwan through legal business. How does it make it so... It it might be a money laundering uh, uh, mission that he's he's laundering money through these different businesses. Haven't you watched? Well, the, like, then, then haven't you watched the Ozark? Why would you then build the entire argument around legal business? Why, why would you introduce someone like I? I have this friend who who has hotels, bike shops, tourism shops, all these businesses, and he makes eight thousand a month. 
because he's too dumb to know if it's illegal or le- or legal. He just wants to get eight grand a month. It's probably super illegal. Well, yeah, yeah. I I, I can actually see that argument. I can, I can see the argument of too dumb because this is also a character who met a dude in prison and in prison the dude told him, yeah, yeah, outside of these walls I make I make a fucking fortune in a month. I'm rolling in money. I like you you would think that some goddamn red flags would be going on yeah. up until that point. Like how can you be rich and in prison at the same time? Well, it's it's like a Chi Huan and a Chang Ho note there that this sounds too good to be true. It's only Chung Sok who is a little bit starstruck by all this information that he re- uh, received in three years in prison. And now Chang Ho asks again, where is this place? Having kind of a short memory or some kind of a seizure going on. It is indeed. If Chang Ho is still wondering, it's Kenting in southern Taiwan. Chang Ho is apparently wearing also the other guy's underwear, or that's what's suggested because the guy keeps stealing everybody's clothes. Anyway, this whole plan is kind of a Shoshankian in nature. Get out of the country and get some money stolen or get some, took some kind of a money stash and then start life anew somewhere far away where you have palm trees and a paradise. Yeah, except in, in Shawshank, they, the dude had a plan. Okay. Are you actually undermining Chang Sok's plan that he has been I, building I, in his head yeah. for three fucking years? Yeah, I'm actually thinking... And, and when I was watching this film, I was I was legitimately thinking that the dude should be in prison for another three years just so that he can, you know, have extra time to figure out his plan one or two times again, over. Ah, Ah, come on, come on. It's pretty well planned out, actually, the whole heist it's not, part. It's, the heist it's, it's part not, is well it's, planned. It's, it's, a, it's a goddamn clusterfuck. The, 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 the heist part is an embarrassing mess, which <sighs> does work in the film's context, because the film points out that the four of them are, are amateurs and not in any way professional robbers. And that's precisely why the heist actually actually works, because when you look at the heist, it's just... It's it's kind of a mismanage and it's it's a it's a clusterfuck of stupidity. Really, they first of all yeah. they have a car. They change the license plates. They make it uh, painted in a different color. They, they, they painted they... a black car black. <laughs> Jesus fuck! What? Man. Come on! <laughs> it's, then... it's black. They, <laughs> they paint the car in the same color to give it a cover paint. Are you Christ! Sure? But. You know, they also make the time, the, how much it takes from those dogs to get from point A to point B, which is three minutes, of course, is really stupid. Why would they be so far in this other building, taking over the gambling security business and not being in the actual building where they're supposed to take control? Well, you could make arguments, of course. Okay, potential robbers comes into the gambling casino and uh, they do not see, they do not understand that there are also some other guards out there that could be released in a few minutes into their asses before they get to leave the premises. And that's kind of what happens here, because they don't get out in time. Yeah, they also don't get in time because they waste their time in... When, when, when they refuse to start using force against the, the security guards right away, that they spend mm. like like what thirty seconds of, of the five minute window when when they are when the two security guards are, uh, guards are just da- standing there and they are just shouting at them. So so like, get, your... get on your knees, get on the ground, and then finally somebody realizes to, to fire a warning shot at the air. That's also also the magic point when when the dude who were supposed or, or the guy, fatso who was supposed to hit the money ward finally actually starts to ad- advance towards the money world, so time was spent burnt also there. Also, you know, the poor, poor Fatso has to actually keep an eye on the cashier lady as as she empties the money world, and also, you know, make note within his limited time window to take the hard drives for the security cameras. I, I would have, like, put in two guys to the cashier's place. One, keeping an eye on the cashier and getting the money out, and the second guy quickly grabbing the hard drives and then maybe, you know, falling back to keep an eye on on the on the gamblers. Well, it's not like the movie's trying to hide this fact. It's, it's actually trying to establish that this is a bit of a fuck-up in the making. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, 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 they do. And, and because of that, it, it works in the film's, film's context. But you are the one who proposed to me the question, how do they fuck up? And that's how they fuck up. Yeah. That, 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 that's all. Right. That, that's okay. a few fuck ups. Fair enough. You got there going. Fair enough. Indeed. Yeah, we see a lot of drugs and guns everywhere. We do see people there uh, sometimes. Not millions, but... Uh, quote, why are you not bringing up our money to paperweight? Chunsok asks, and this is where the full stop break hit happens. <laughs> this was absurd. Why would you do that? But anyway, uh, they uh, discussed the, how the money is now worthless, and Chunsok's money has become worthless. The cash value has collapsed like a mofo, and currency exchanges are currently illegal. And that's exactly what happens in countries like Venezuela and stuff. They don't want to make people actually prosperous. They want to protect their protect and serve their own currency. Well, de- de- dealing a hyperinflation situation is actually quite difficult for, yep. for the nation. That's why you shouldn't, like, like really, in, in real life, if, if you're a country, you shouldn't just, you know, start the, the money process and just press a shit ton of money. Because Venezuela, mm-hmm. and I, I maybe Time to Hunt's case is where that eventually leads you. When, when you. when you actually land yourself in hyperinflation, that's, that's really difficult. It, it's not impossible, but it's really goddamn difficult to fix the situation after that because you just crashed your own currency and your own currency is basically the all the economical power that you have. To fix the situation, you... Well, I would say you mostly need the help of all the other countries. You you need governmental loans and stuff like that. Especially in Time to Hunt's case, the loan also is out of the question because IMF refuses to give any more loan to South Korea. But re-establishing the value of, of your currency once you've actually crashed it, that's that's really hard to, to pull off. All right, yes. And then we have the Paradise Bicycles, which which serves as a kind of a warehouse or a operation center for these guys. And there's an establishing shot first of factories. I found that the establishing shots and the camera work in general is one of the best parts of the film. Like you, here you have a fact. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Well, at least we level on, the, on there because, you know, establishing shots usually... Even though we get kind of exciting establishing shots nowadays with all the drones and shit, here you have a, a, a sequence that probably was played in reverse, or maybe the uh, camera was going in reverse, I don't know. But it's kind of interesting how the camera moves in unconventional ways. It goes backwards, pulls out, it goes sideways in a tilted fashion. And the cinematographer, this is a first-timer called Lim Bon Jun. So consider- considering that... It's a time of applause because this is some of the best camera work for this podcast in a while, even though we have gone through a lot of great cinema. All right, let's talk about the actor profiles a little bit. So we have Lee Che Hoon. He started his career in indie films, went to appear in commercial films. Thereafter, The Frontline 2011, uh, My Paparotti from 2013. Several TV series as like Secret Door from 2014. Uh, studied in the School of Drama at Korea National University of Arts. In the beginning of his, of his career, he appeared in several indie films. There was this uh, queer romantic film, Just Friends? Question mark. It, which, which was a short film that ran for about 30 minutes, if I remember correctly, and caused a ratings controversy in South Korea. And it was a special one as... There are very few Korean films that depict homosexuality, let's say, realistically. And this is what this one aimed for. Not all of this uh, stereotypic bullshit that you usually get. He has starred alongside the veteran actor Hansi Kyu, who we know in this podcast from Shiri as the lead actor. With Hansi Kyu in The Pavarotti and The Secret Door. And uh, apart from Time to Hunt, there's... Another film starring him, scheduled for 2020 release, it's called Doom Robbery. He has done some uh, like uh, refugee camp work. He donated his time for relief activities in Tanzania in March 2016. Good guy, good guy. On June 5th, uh, uh, we will know whether he will win the Best Actor accolade for Time to Hunt at the 56th Baksang Arts Awards. He said that, quote... Uh, 
or not fucking quote, but he he said that he continued to wear street fashion even after this uh, film Time to Hunt had ended filming and started to revamp his personal style. And he said, interestingly, that the, uh, regarding the different kind of outwears that you wear, you also kind of modify yourself and your how you view yourself in a way that you will start acting differently. You will start to... Uh, get this kind of a different personality going if you wear a beard. This happens to me. I don't know what the hell is, what kind of a magic shit it is. But if I have a beard, I change as a person. Watch out for that. So that's why I usually don't have a beard. What about you, Henrik? Do you get psycho when you have a beard? I don't use beard. All right. That there's something with my hair growth. Way too little testosterone. Oh, say no more. Um, He said also that Quote, I always act as if it is my last project. The public constantly wants new people and new stars, and those stars are constantly appearing. Wouldn't there be a lot of actors who could replace me? Then I think, isn't there something I can do that can't be replaced? I have to continue working with the thought that I want to become an irreplaceable person, end quote. So every movie that he joins, he takes this outlook that this is the last project that I will ever do. Because it very much might be in these, these times. And this is a tough competition. Fans have nicknamed him as No Fun. I'm not sure why, but... Uh, about his character in the film, well, he wants to go to Taiwan and be rich. Uh, to get there, he needs to rob the gambling den, and there's adversaries that come by, and he needs to overcome those in his character arc. And he does overcome the fear towards the antagonist by the end of the film, which kind of wraps it up nicely. We, we can get to that and fight about that. Uh, the sequel page quite nicely. That too, that too. Then we have uh, Chushik. This is uh, the Korean-Canadian actor that the world knows mostly for the film Parasite. Or and Train to Busan. Train to Busan, yes. They don't know him enough, as for some reason the individual actor and their performances haven't really received enough attention after Parasite, <laughs> even though Parasite works precisely thanks to its performances, which is a kind of a curious case. The studio that he has worked for was never really into pushing this guy out there, like give him the attention that Jusik deserves. And he did just recently change studios or the agency that he was working for because it was going nowhere. He was doing great uh, lead roles and should have gathered a lot of attention, but uh, he was just going nowhere career-wise. Until now, with uh, flicks like Time to Hunt, and he is much more happier what is going on in his, in his world. I don't know. I mean, you know, his his castings may make still make him Hobong John regular. I mean, he on on top of Parasite, he also appeared in Okja, which is a film that also now streams on on Netflix. So now, yeah, there there there's, there there are two Hobong John films: The Strange Busan. I, I wouldn't say that his career necessarily is at a dead end and he's he's completely faceless. Also, when it comes to international cinema markets, because because of those films. Yeah, yeah. I just know that uh, he never was uh, satisfied with the company that he was working for, and he has done a lot since since twenty ten. He has been in quite reputable TV series and movies. Yeah, he was the truck driver in Okja, the movie about the super pig who gets stolen from a small village. It's like a plot idea. It was absolutely outrageous, but I checked it out and I enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, he had a pretty funny part as the truck driver. He decides to support the protagonist all of a sudden and acts against his employer's will and has some great lines there. In 2018, he also appeared in The Witch Part 1 subversion. It's unknown if there will actually be a second part. And I was wondering if, there, if it's even something that they have in the cards, but then I watched the movie and clearly yes. But, uh, you know, it's been quite a bit of time since that came out, so I'm, I'm not sure if they're gonna move on with it. It uh, received a bit of a mixed reviews. It's about people who have supernatural witch powers. Chusik plays the evil character there. Yeah, so if you ever wanted to see how a kind of a Korean puppy boy face converts into an evil witch, look no further than that. And that part of the film actually worked. In 2019, of course, Parasite, say no more. Yeah, we, we have said a ton about that film, maybe not get back back with Parasite. And he also 
has appeared in a weird, weird South Korean one night food trip, season one. It's a Korean TV series where famous people eat different foods and then they tell how it was. It's oddly addictive, Henrik. I mean, just watching these rich, rich people eating for hours. <laughs> Yeah, somehow I I have a strange feeling I'm most definitely gonna skip that. <laughs> w- w- watching some rich assholes just, you know, stuff their mouths with food. <laughs> yeah. He was asked why he chose the role in Time to Hand and he said, quote, It was a side of me I couldn't show everyone before. I was also excited to see the process of how the movie would be made together with the director and the rest of the cast. The way I looked in the film was a good fit for Gi-hoon. At first I was worried about my hairstyle. The picture that the director gave me for a reference was a picture of Leonardo DiCaprio when he was young and playing a rebellious character. So I was worried because it was very different from me." End quote. And then he laughed and still added, quote, However, it seems to have come out all right in the film, so I'm satisfied, end quote. He also said, After the opening part of the film, I often had to act horror-struck and nervous, so I worried about how to show that fear in different ways. I thought it would be weird if I kept making the same face, so I decided on a level of fear for each scene. But ultimately, more than me deciding the level of fear, it was the sweaty makeup that had a greater effect. I don't play youthful characters on purpose, but I think there's a lot of charming in being able to show how they grow and develop. When that character grows up, I get under the illusion that I'm growing up with them as well, just like director Bong Joon-ho told me. You look sad. I think the image suits me as well. End quote. His friends uh, Park Seo-jun and Park hyung sik watched uh, Time to Hand as well, and Ju sik said about that, One of the advantages of a film being on Netflix is that people can watch it even if they're busy and can go to a theater. My busy friends also took the time to watch it. They complimented me a lot. I swear a lot in the film. And I think that was impressive for them. They kept mimicking my lines and teasing me." And uh, for some more details, uh, Park Seo-jun is a very, very good friend of his. They've been so friendly together that it it has even sparked gay rumors, but they are simply really close friends. Uh, Bak Seo-jun is the guy who did the cameo in Parasite as Min, as the well-off student who gives his uh, teaching duties over to Ju Six's character. Apart from Jun Sok, the other characters don't have as deep character development, but more or less uh, Ju Six's character in this film has the same goals as the lead characters. So once the wants to pull off the heist and but he has parents so he needs to protect them and decides to do it so finally at the end. But a dynamic character as well. We get to the gambling house. This place is a little bit uh, hard to access. They have to take the elevator and uh, elevator and they sit at the table. There's Jun Sok uh, who sees the uh, safe that is being opened, sloppy casino really, where are the blinders and all. And Sang Su happens to work in the gambling house. So Jun Sok uses Sang Su to the best of his ability. There's a discussion about the Sang Su, how he owns owes money to uh, Jung Sok in the amount of about 8.2k in dollars. But uh, he wants it really in dollars, not in one, of course, because it's worthless. Says he wants 10,000, which includes the interest. Now we're getting the rest of the, the plot that, that the, or the plan that Jun Sok wants to run here. So Casino is the target run by small-time thugs. ki says that a better idea would be to rob a bank and then be thrown back to jail. But Jun Sok is not listening to any of that. But he has a very good point that the gambling houses are easier than banks in the sense that maybe the cops will not be on their asses with shots of a velocity that they would be if they would be robbing a bank. And they would be harder to track because, you know, illegal business and people robbing illegal business illegally. Yeah, the the only downside of the plan is that usually mafia and other professional crime outfits, if if you rob them, they, they, they... they use these things called guns. They are, they are, they are stuff. They decide that they have nothing to lose now, so we get to the inciting incident of the film, the catalyst. And there's an additional plot point, quote, he got caught while trying to buy us time. He rotted in jail for three years because of us. So Zhang Ho is already sold on the whole idea. Savings are worthless, their lives haven't changed, can't get a job because of criminal records. 
which is weird, really. No job at all. But this is their argument that they can't probably start a business or get any money. Yeah, it, it is a bit weird. The, I, I, I can see that you can't get some jobs. Like, for example, governmental, security, police. Those lines of work most likely are cut off from you because you have a criminal record. That's how it goes in, in Finland also. Like, don't, don't do serious crime or you can't be a cop. Makes perfect sense. But, but all work... Factory work that they also check your background in 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 factories and and they do make the case that they're they they have owned or at least their mom has has owned a business before because there is the whole notion of the old bike rental shop which is now defunct so so that they have been able to have jobs in at least in some capacity capacity and and what why, why is why why can't they do it. Anymore? Why? Why is the criminal record so so all or nothing deal? And why exactly do they have that criminal record? Like what? Yeah, they all took part in the age old heist when when they tried to rob was it a bank? But the only one who got caught and did did jail jail time was was just you know the main guy guy Jun Seok. I read it as that they had all done jail time, but uh, only Jun Sok was there for a longer period. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Could could be, could be. It's but it's never actually established that the rest of them would have also been in jail. Like that they they were even able to keep on the the what what they called the paperweight, that they secret stash of of money which they got from that original heist. So if all of them would have gotten caught and done jail time, I well maybe cops couldn't have found the secret stash of of stolen money, but that's kind of a already really gambling the odds there. Like most likely the cops would have found the money stash in that case. Yeah, I'm not gonna really inspect this area because. There's not a lot that has been said about the past, but they pulled off some robbery and, well, well, they are bound to have criminal records. But hey, everybody's convinced, so second act starts here. Let's go batshit crazy. They are taking pictures of the security camps. They have maps uh, somehow of the perimeters. Maybe they mapped them by themselves. Uh, looks kind of hand-drawn. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that, that the illegal gambling then just, you know... <sighs> Handed the map out to what? the one dude who works for them. If that's what Sun, you want Sun to believe, Su, go ahead. Even though that makes no goddamn sense. Well, you can take the hardest way to think about it <laughs> as you wish. Well, well, mo mo most likely the most logical explanation for that, e even though the film doesn't say that this is the case, but would but most logical would be that since it's it's on governmental land, most likely the buildings. It means that there's a, you know, record on governmental archives about the lands and, and the mapping yeah. of the area. And they could just, you know, get a map from there since those archives would be public. Oh, that's how it goes in Finland. Hard, hard to say what the case is for now financially defunct South Korea. And some for some reason, the perimeters are not properly secured. The roof is not secured. Fire escape through the roof to the warehouse to the gambling house is perfectly all right. Way to access. We have quite notable music, which I was kind of fancying. But they also find that there are six guards. And Gihun and Jun Sok take, the, take out the guards. And Sung Su and Zhang Ho are to take care of the other end of the gambling house. And once both ends are secured, they are supposed to get to the safe. And a gang outpost is not the gambling building, but uh, but uh, it's about three to five minutes away. That's a weird point, as mentioned. We get to the arms dealer, and it's something that should be taken into context here, that South Korea does not have the equivalent of the United States when it comes to the Second Amendment there. Instead, uh, there's a strong enforcement of strict gun control. So if you, even if you own privately owned weapons, you need them to be stored at the police station. And therefore, the fatal shootings hardly ever happen. So this is a big deal. The arms dealer and uh, Jun Sok know each other. The arms dealer has also a twin brother, as we will find out later. There's K2, Sam Force. Ever used any of those guns? 
Uh, especially seeing my locations, kind of a, <clears throat> can't comment on that. <laughs> it, it it might raise some some questions if I would hypothetically say yes. Well, do you know what other kind of raises raises questions here? There's this arms dealer, and we do not actually know if any cash was involved in this transaction. That the guy just hands them the guns, and uh, then uh, Junsok says that thanks for trusting me and giving me the guns. What yeah, is th- yeah. That, it, it it appears to be the case, especially since you already mentioned the extremely strict gun laws in in South Korea, which would mean that well, the illegal arms dealer would take extremely heavy heavy risks here. Uh, a right. because I- illegal arms dealer and B because well anybody who would be waving any kind of a gun would kind of a stick out like a sore thumb because of the strict gun laws. So you would because because of the because of the risk involved, you would think that illegal guns in South Korea would be really expensive. And the film makes a clear point that they don't really have any money left. Or, or what little they have is not even enough to cover cover the the rent on their apartment. And on so top of- it, it kind of lends a lot of weight into this this take that the arms dealer just, you know, gives them the guns. And on top of that, you have Chang Ho, who has, as they say, hasn't gone to the army. And in any case, you don't need to go to the army, of course, to know how to operate guns. But it's suggested that he is completely a newbie when it comes to weaponry. And so Jun Sok is uh, the one who is giving him, him some quick training before they go to pull the heist of their lives. It's a bit, uh, do you want Chang Ho really to be involved here? But he's the guy who is given pretty much the biggest responsibility, taking the security camera footage, hard disks, and heisting the safe. Yeah, yeah, like like the poor guy ba- basically has to carry almost the entire heist on his on his shoulders while he while he his friends just stay back and well guard the few security guards who already are in tip ties making them pretty much defenseless and and then just some complete randos who most likely are unarmed and are there just to have a good time therefore the least likely to cause any trouble for 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 our main heroes and they're creating unnecessary evidence. Like they have this little pose that they strike and they take the awkward gun hose photo. And they, they do. I'm they surprised do. that it doesn't stab them in the eye later. I was also expecting to see the moment when that little mistake would come back to bite them in the ass. But once again, in, in the film's defense, it, it all works because the film makes clear through the dialogue that these guys are amateurs and don't send, don't really have any idea what they are doing like essentially what they what they are trying to pull off here is your typical movie heist they they try to perform the heist from the tips that they you can get from basically any b grade cops and robbers film did you just describe this podcast <laughs> well th- this podcast has a uh, be, being a goddamn medical, economical, and also small-time criminality 101, so... <laughs> yeah, no, 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 of course we are nothing but professionals here, with years of uh, experience behind us, but uh, now they are... In, in, in this educational product. In this educational product. In this education. The car is getting a makeover, here's the dying, and... Uh, Kihun has some kind of a problem with Jun Sok's ideas. He calls them boring, like all this that we're gonna do for fishing and sauna. Really? Well, isn't that the finished dream? Well, it, it, it is. It is. It is finished dream. But then again, Finland is the the ass and hicks wheel of of countries. Yeah. Uh, may, well, maybe like like uh, like pro tip pro tip for all all South Korean mafia heisters. You know. If you heist and and rob mafia gambling, then please, please don't, don't, don't create your dreams based on on Finnish Finnish lifestyle and and Finnish dreams. <laughs> You're kind of doing it all for naught in that case. <laughs> but this uh, other dream of Gihun's uh, surfing and picking picking up chicks, yeah, well, why not? Depends. Well, 
your reverence yeah, is. Yeah, it, 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 it's a nice dream. At the same time, it's a, it's a nice dream that doesn't make you any money, meaning that if you want to keep on that lifestyle, you just have to rob more shit as time goes on. Yeah. The problem with illegal money is always that, you know, you know it's basically just uh, grocery store money. That's all you can do about it. Pretty much, yeah, because it's it's all, all like it, it's a complete fucking nightmare to get that illegal money into the into a bank, yeah. into your bank account, so that you can do some really big shit w- yeah. with that money. You gotta have to somehow somehow launder it first. Oh, you're thinking great things. Yeah, yeah. So so you use horse tracks for that. Ah, we'll talk about this after this episode. So there's new fellas at the safe, uh, which concerns Sang Su. He's the guys who've never been there before. I'm not sure actually how it's related to anything, but there are some people who uh, visit the safe. Then we see that they are packing the packing the car, and uh, Jun Sok is looking at a picture of his mother at the parasite pa- paradise bicycles. <laughs> <laughs> parasite everywhere. <laughs> well, well, they are poor, so. <laughs> Yeah. You know, if, if, if you have if you have some, some <laughs> thoughts about poor people, just you know, just just let them all out. Nobody is listening. Holy cockroach! They're approaching. <laughs> <laughs> they're approaching gambling house. There's a nice overview shot. Goes from city to the car, kind of a full wide shot. Jung Ho will be responsible for snatching the security footage as established, and the actual high stakes play. In uh, what is, uh, as stated a million times already, is kind of a shambolic plan. But somehow, for now, they pull it off. Alarm goes off. Uh, they open the safe, they leave, and they shoot. There's this one guy that caught my attention, the guard, that already makes the case that these guys are amateurs. You're amateurs. Do you really think that you'll be safe? La, la, la. And this very kind of Asian thing when you're listening to somebody and you know that they are right or they are above your authority level, then you are not able to or, or you shouldn't look them in the eye. The guy looks elsewhere, but on, it's only after the guy starts to piss him off enough, he switches his eye focus back to the guy. These security men, they are, like, they are also a bunch of amateurs, really. Why is the building not secured from each and every side when they arrive with the car. It doesn't seem like they're doing that because they're able to yeah. get to go to the other side and then escape. Yeah, and wh- 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 why does the cashier take fucking forever to press the alarm? L- like, she presses the alarm only after the, the our heroes fire the warning shot, which is like something like, what, minute and 30 seconds into the whole heist? So, yeah, good job wasting your time there, lady. And also the, the other guy, the one who is, I'm, I'm guessing, kind of in command of the cashier and who has the revolver stuck stuck in the drawer, he, he also just kind of sits there and never actually takes the gun out. Like, most likely the door to the, to the cashier would have, is, is by default, would be locked. Or at least there would be a capability to lock the door and you would have a gun. So, and all you would have to do is, is just, you know, make sure that you hold off the robbers for five minutes for the security to get there. So, see, see, seeing how usually Mafia kind of manages you with, with death if you fuck up these kind of things, you would kind of expect the, the in-command dude to just, you know, whip the gun out, fire the alarm button, and then close the door, lock the door. And just, you know, barricade in, into the vault room with all the cash. And just try to hold the robbers off for five minutes. Yeah, and at the moment when they're sweating like pigs and they're about to blow off the lock that is holding the big door that gets them into the gambling house. Once they finally shoot the, the lock away, they actually are expecting that the lock will actually break from this first impact. Well, okay, movie magic. But then afterwards, there's... A lot of seconds that go by, Henrik, and the, the the security people who seem to be just perplexed by the situation for more than five seconds could have taken taken the situation at hand. At least they could have taken an aim uh, towards the door where they're approaching, but none of that happens, and they completely lose the momentum. Yeah. Celebrating, 
Once they get out of the building somehow and run to safety and take the car and somebody somehow nobody gets shot and they do not hit the tires as usually you would do if you have brains. They don't, they go celebrating now as the gang and the, there's the joke about the CCTV t material that <laughs> Chang Ho is playing with the guys that possibly he didn't even take them with him, but he did. And they're so relieved. Cut to this uh, antagonist of the night, Han, who is interrogating, I guess, like 20 plus people. This one guy says that I, ca I think I can take care of this and therefore but he only gets a bullet to the head immediately. This is a kind of a, the most shocking death of the film. It's just, it's just there. Poof, and the guy has filled some kind of a swimming hole or whatever kind of a factory place this is. This deepening. There's like 20 people who have been put into body bags already. Yeah, m m I'm, I'm guessing the entire staff from the from that night has now been executed one by one as a punishment for failing to protect the money. Yeah, 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 probably all the security people have gotten a bullet to the head. But then again, why didn't, what about the people at the gambling tables, for example, Sang Su? They were not invited for this bullet to the head party, apparently. Well, yeah, it's, they're not security people, fair enough. Looks like plenty of people have been involved here, <laughs> according to them. Or they want to get people, rid of people who have not been particularly successful in their jobs and we get to know that they didn't even get to the main safe but there was only the exchange safe but still provides plenty of dollars cctv heart unfortunately contains also footage of deals with vips and the list of vips and their laundering data so this is a big deal and they are going kind of an ape nuts so so han is sent to the mission to recover the hard disks. Yeah, which kind of also begs the, begs the question. See, if, if you are head of a, of a mafia criminal organization and you, you are making deals with public figures and laundering a million dollars of cash, then uh, why, why, why the fuck do you store all the discriminating evidence against you and against those public figures in, in, in the hard drives of your gambling den where most likely at least a security personnel get can get get access into the hard drive since somebody actually has to keep an eye on the security cameras and if necessary go through the security camera footage which gets saved on those same goddamn hard drives the u.s public medical care system why do they lose this data there's like a lot of stupidity when it goes to data storage it, it goes it goes but but you know the medical in in the defense of medical services you are talking about the u.s medical services yeah and u.s itself is a miserable hell planet where no logic abides so oh dear did you hear that or you know, u.s listeners m m most likely not because we don't have u.s listeners oh we don't don't we have the, like majority of them are the u.s listeners <laughs> so, uh, I, don't I, I don't know i i, I, don't, I don't follow the goddamn statistics do we have listeners yeah, apparently we do. Like, well, <laughs> 90% coming from the US. Or it's just, you know, Google Pot. <laughs> I, 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 I'm just, you know, I, I'm still holding on the case that it's just your mom. And now you have taught her how to use a VPN. So <laughs> it, it looks like we get all these clicks from the US. I wish I could see the day that her internet usage would be so sophisticated. <laughs> Sang Su, thanks for everything. We get to know that the money he borrowed from Jun Sok was for his mother's hospital bill. Hmm. And uh, he's acting like a gentleman and opens the car door for Jun Sok. They leave the guns here. What? Why didn't they hide the guns and why are they telling Sang Su where the, where the guns are? Very, very bad, boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah kind, of, kind of nonsense. Uh, I, although, I, I do think that in reality, they only left that one revolver into their drawer and they took other guns with them. Because later on in the film, oh, yeah. once the chase or, or the hunt really starts for, for our, our heisters, they don't go back to the bike shop and they are still carrying basically half of Vietnam with them. But more importantly, in Hans' flat in the next scene, we hear about the IMF, but, but, but this guy collects ears? And it's shown to us only casually that there's collected ears on the wall. Kind of love that little nugget of detail. Did you catch that? 
Uh, I I did, and I also did pay notice to that fact. It kind of a, basically all lends into this super duper, super duper badass hitman dude who Han is supposed to be. Like he he checks all the boxes, wears a long coat, doesn't really talk, is a badass with guns, collects ears, is a master hacker fortune. Most likely hacks the planet also a couple of times. I I'm certain that if we would get a director's cut of the film, there would also be scene that would show his katana collection. <laughs> Workers' demonstration. Gihun's father is there with a big smile. Quote, if you're gonna protest with a smile, then don't, says Gihun. Or, yeah, Gihun. That's, that's kind of a good point. I never understood people, especially in Finland, for fuck's sake. They go protesting, or they claim to be protesting something, and then they go into the TV news and look at that beautiful smile that they have on their face. Are you really going to be angry? Or are you just gonna be there casually like, well, I was just walking on the street, I had my kids with their just pushing my kitty wagons here while I'm walking. I, I didn't have anything well, better to do here. Actually, actually, you are describing a Finnish protester. Exactly. <laughs> Like, it, it, it's not even a joke. I mean, goddammit, Finnish protesters might be the most polite, the least intimidating protesters that you can find from anywhere. They are all there just casually. Maybe someone has a has a sign if he's like a real badass protester. And, and the ultra mega giga badass protester might even even shout something once or twice. But that's that's the Finnish protesters. And that's it. that's why it's so goddamn funny that the Finnish police in response then has to have all, all, all this technical ultra SWAT gear when they meet the Finnish protesters. Like, Jesus fuck. Yeah, um sorry my Dutch friend, I'm not going to pick up your call. We have more important discussions going on here about the Finnish protester mentality. I will call you later. Yes, goodbye. Sorry. Bye. That's what a podcast does to you. Isolates you permanently from civilization. Um, so at Gihun's, rock to the well is thrown. Well in the backyard. <laughs> that is the funny joke of the situation. Get me some water from that well. Fuck you. Mother is happy about a shirt. We made a ton of money, so I can buy you anything. Why would you again say that? Yeah, it kind of raises a lot of questions from your parents. Like, like for example, where did you get all the money? Yep, and the, the face of the mother is exactly kind of mirroring that, that. What the hell did you do once again? But I'm not willing to go into this right now. Arms dealer, the worst liar in the world, the Han comes to interrogate him. He's not able to at, lie on any level in the situation. The arms dealer in turn says that he'll be not safe if Han threatens him. Oh, 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 that's funny. Back to Gihun's and Gihun and Yun Jun Sok are about to leave for some business and Jung Ho sleeps and then wakes up and joins. Of course, this... Uh, Gag is played out later when he, pff, funnily enough, actually dies and not, he's not going to be sleeping anymore. But it's something more permanent of a sleep. Arms dealer massacre. Gonna hunt takes everyone out except the boss uh, for now. And so, let me get this straight. You, you own a gun store and you do it illegally. And you don't have a gun at your desk to take out this Han guy. Why? No, no, of course, you, you store all those guns in a locked room in a vault. Okay, well, uh, I guess this was his life's goal, to die in this way. Arms dealer calls. Junsok is stupid enough to tell their location, East Sea, and he can't call him back. Han then proceeds to blow up the entire arms house for reasons. And back at Gihun's for the third time. The mom doesn't want his son to leave as they know see each other apparently for the first time after two years. Not sure why, but uh, yeah. Two-year plan for Taiwan. And then he would potentially be back in his mummy's arms. Jun Sok calls Sang Su. He's on his way to work, nervous as hell. And Sang Su, of course, come in, comes into contact with these two guards who are very suspicious of him somehow. Goes babbling to his co-worker that, thank God we were off yesterday. We could have been fucked. Colleague shakes his head. In disapproving way, I suppose to do to the guards, or what was it? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm guessing that 
at this point basically everybody has has figured out that also everyone who wasn't present at the jobs yesterday everybody who had a day off yesterday when the the heist took place is now also a suspect for being an inside man in the heist that's the mafia way of life runs for his life and trembles stumbles and I like how this movie does this kind of a fake alarms that the guy falls on 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 his way when he's running and then there's a shot at the alley if there if there's something coming or not but there's nothing happening there's a lot of situation in this film that you expect one thing and then it delivers another thing they, they, they and especially do. it's true for Han yeah yeah, yeah. They, this uses a lot of reverse expectations yes Yes, 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 yes. It's not the typical heist film where you know that, okay, they're going to heist a joint, then they get the money and, oh, the police, somebody is on their, on their backs and at some point they're going to prison or something horrible is going to happen to them, they usually die. And, well, people do actually die here, but uh, it's not what you expect. You have this guy who supposedly works for a mafia, but it's not only that, he is also a cop and the whole police force seems to have been corrupted so to the core that even the top dogs let him go later when he is captured i i'm not i'm, I'm not so certain if han was ever meant to be a cop character he does drive a cop car and he does have through the car he does have an access to basically every single security camera known to man but I'm not certain if, if he's supposed to be a cop character and not just a high-end governmental assassin or some or, or a hitman who has a government official's backing. And this way, the leeway to have access to high-end gear, like, for example, the super duper hyper duper cop car. Well, I saw that, that he's... He's a corrupted cop who has gotten some uh, different kinds of rights that uh, he, for some reason, the, the cops see that this guy is important to, that he should be left, let go. Maybe the, the mafia is linked with the police force in a way that they can, you know, discuss with the, the lead and get him out of the situation. Well, ma Mafia most likely is, or at, at least the Mafia is, is in league with the governmental officials. And since police is also a governmental entity, it kind of goes in hand, hand in hand that the governmental official might also be a top dog towards the police force and this way can, can demand things from the cops. Like, for example, letting Han go once the cops arrest him. Yeah. But literally, there is nothing that can get this guy prostrated. Even at the end, we get the suggestion that the guy is still alive. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. This is what, once again, the mysterious super hyper assassin guy where, where all, all this plays off. Also, the dude somehow, well, he, he does use the script to teleport all, all over the place. He also is is master tracker and and of course as as this high end ultra badass hitman always do he also has this tendency of of capturing his prey then letting them run and recapturing them and letting them run and it's all just part of the game that he wants to play I guess because he doesn't have any other jobs lining up so he has like. <laughs> A hell of a lot of time to spend on just killing a few teenagers. I took it in a way that because he seems to already know what the plan is that they're going to leave the country, uh, suppose he has gotten the information that they're heading for Taiwan. And if so, then he could potentially make the case that they are trying to grab a boat somewhere. Maybe there's not that many harbors that you can get to this particular location, who knows. And uh, based on that, and by the itinerary that they have, so far, he could follow them. He, he, he could to a point, but then again, the characters also make the notion that they, they switch cities and they they look up not near them hospitals when one of their friend when, when the fat show gets wounded and they need ER. So they they like the, the group of friends really take the time. They drive a hell of a long way to get a far away hospital to get their friend 
some medical aid. And they are also, after the hospital scene, they, they hole up in these derelict buildings in, in middle of nowhere and in abandoned boatyards. Which you would kind of think that there would be extra hard locations to to find out and especially track your prey into those locations. But none of that provides any difficulty for our for Han, our hitman character. You gotta suspend your disbelief a little bit, but you know, let's say that uh, he is able to as uh, he's driving a cop and has uh, access to cop ingenuity maybe he's able to track their phone calls as this is some kind of a dystopian shit that could be 50 years into the future and uh, there's a easy ability to track phone calls just like that well maybe it could be just maybe they could have that as well now but imagine a country that is in a brink of a destruction and uh, probably all the you know usual paperwork is is out, out of the way and they can just do it well, yeah, yeah, could, could be. Like, I was also thinking about the aspect of, of phone tracking, which could actually explain some of it. Or on top of the fact that his cop, the cop car also has the the ability to access basically all the security cameras in the world. <laughs> uh, yeah, but but yeah, that the phone tracking could also be something that plays a factor here because even though the, the economy has collapsed and all these characters are poor as shit, they still can afford to to, to brand new high-end smartphones and, and nice cars and mm. petrol. Well, maybe those are the Nokia 1100s of those days. Well, maybe, yeah. It, it kind of lends a hand that you are never actually shown what year it is when South Korean economy goes down the drain. Yeah, now they are leaving Gihun's apartment and the guys... Junso and Chang Ho are overlooking when Gihun is saying his goodbyes to his parents and uh, the only one of the bunch who indeed has a family to go to. But indeed, for how long? We'll never know just quite yet. But but uh, there's the quote, what's it like to have parents? You won't feel lonely, right? I've never had a fa- family. I always was alone. And Jun Sook gets teary-eyed and says Gihun and him are his family. De facto, and that that is that is true. Uh, this is uh, let's put a flag here. This is something that they will once again get to in the end point. Remember this. This will pay in the end. So more character development clearly in the middle of the movie still going on. Uh, Sang Su escapes or tries to escape. Paradise bicycles is the location. It's a nice shot at moon. Everything is very red and bloodish here. Money is still there. Gun too. But he could not possibly make any more noise with the drawers, so that's probably the reason why Han is there. Or he just teleports. He he just teleports because he's already kind of as lazily sitting on on chair there. Kind of just, you know, having that badass Hitman moment where you let your prey pass you by unseen and then you make a, a subtle noise, like flicking your, your lighter. That's what gives you a prey to him, that you are right behind him and you got him. <laughs> it's Real irresistible. I- I- irresistible. Like, like no, 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 no badass hitman can ever actually resist pulling these kind of antics. Yeah, none of those uh, electrical cigars or anything. But, you know, Sang Su had the revolver on his pelvis anyway. Like, why not just try to shoot the guy? Be like the Wild Wild West situation. But, uh, well, Han is on top of the game. Sun Tzu death dream follows. There's two death dreams about Sun Tzu, and in both cases he is kind of giving hints conveniently. The the guys are playing with firecrackers on Nightly Beach. Maybe it's Taiwan or the East Sea location. Who knows? And Jun Sok manages to shoot Sun Tzu with one blood coming from stomach and the eyes. There's this, this, there's this uh, scratchy loop music and insect music, what I call insect music, which is very prevalent in the... For example, the TV series X-Files. Maybe that was the birthing ground for the insect music. You know, when there's something disgusting happening, when there's maybe like a cockroach going through your eyeballs, that's when you get the music, and that's there. Waking up, Jun Sok wakes up from the dream, and there's a nice focus pull to the mirror. You don't first know exactly the shape in the background, whether it's Jun Sok in a mirror image or somebody in front of him ready to pull the trigger. Uh, I love this kind of a red alerts. Junsuk goes out for a smoke. Sangsu is not picking up. 
And Junso goes into the bar. It's a dark damn bar. You know, are, are they always this dark in Korea? I guess it's just the economy, man. I, I I'm guessing it's the economy. Yeah. Like you, you in in this economy, you you have to shave off few 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 wounds from your electric bill. Han picks up the call on the Sangsu's phone. Nobody there except some random breathing. Because why not? Have to intimidate your victims. Badass hitman. It's kind of the Halloween moment. It, it is. It is. This is. This actually is is very re- reminiscent of of horror movies. Like you, you especially Asian horror movies, you often get these kind of kind of a scenes where somebody is getting weird phone calls, and then you have like nothing or just heavy breathing or something like a like a rattling noise, <laughs> something like that, just coming from the other end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's it. And the, this is definitely the moment where it just turns into straight up horror at moments, and I kind of like that switch. The chase is on. Yeah, I I do also. Uh, it it takes like I said, it it takes something like fucking hour and fifteen minutes to get to this point. <laughs> But from this point onwards, I do actually feel that the film gets more effective. I do think that the second half of the film is is more is I I would even say better than the first half. Oh yeah, I'm on board with you, a hundred percent, hundred percent. They need to get their guns from the trunk. Because of what had just happened, and the car doesn't start up, something has been done to it. They decide to snatch one truck from the parking lot, and the guys provide cover while Chang Ho is trying to connect the car wiring. Well, there's just a little bit of a problem, of course, with these goddamn connecting car wiring things. At least in the modern cars, even if you connect the wiring and start up the car, you still have the problem of the steering wheel. It's still gonna be locked. So instead, you'd probably have to. Whack a screwdriver a couple of times inside the key lock, and then twist around in an effort to to try and break the steering lock, and that would then uh, also uh, start the engine. If I'm getting my shit correct here in the flick lab, so if you want to if you want to heist a car, just turn for us for help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, of course. Note here, we we don't endorse this kind of behavior. Oh no, I'm just just saying. You know. So just just hi- hypothetically, if 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 you want want robbery tips and and you have some cash, just you know PM us on Facebook. <laughs> It won't be me who is answering to that one. S- 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 send us money through coffee. <laughs> <laughs> that will help us with us with the motivation. <laughs> Car alarm shuts down when you connect the cables. Apparently, not quite sure about that. And the car park lights shut off. The dude has a lot of influence in this film. It it, it does. Like th- this is where the my my previous remark of of the hitman also being master hacker comes up because <laughs> apparently he has hacked the trio's car previous car. So now th- now they have to join another car, and and he's also hacked the power grid, which gives him the ability to dramatically. Shut down the lights in the car lot, and dramatically, he is exactly where he wants them to be. They drive out in the right entrance. Maybe there was one entrance, okay. But he's on the way, standing there, and then shoots Chang Ho. Car crashes. Yeah, more more, more noticeably, he's standing right in the middle of of, of the of the driveway, as, lo- as as you do when you are a badass hitman. Yeah. <laughs> As uh, when you are a badass Michael Myers, this is the kind of teleport stuff that you do. But uh, orders Junzok out of the car. Junzok uh, gathers his strength during this and stops being afraid towards him. Doesn't show that he's being afraid when he's uh, ready to go. And this impresses him. Jeminen, he says. Interesting. He says this twice. Note this. It's in the beginning. When we first see Han, when he gets the call about this whole gig, he says, "Jeminen, interesting." First, he's impressed by the stolen hard disks, and now the bravery. And because it's all a big game at this point for him, for all we know, he has probably already gotten the hard disks. We as an audience don't exactly, I think, know where they were placed. Maybe they were in the bicycle store, wherever they no, were but- lying around. 
Yeah, we, we don't know where the hard disks were, but we do, in the end, we do learn that the Hitman has already acquired the hard disks. And therefore, when it comes to the whole, whole his mission, kill the robbers, get the hard disks, emphasis on get the fucking hard disk, which, which has all, all the discriminating evidence, that part has already been, been fulfilled, and now he's hunting them just for sport. Or is it fulfilled? It's not worded out. What he says later on this film after the hospital, when they have the call in the police car, he says that he has already gotten what he wanted to, more or less. And I'm su- I'm supposing that is the hard disks. Yeah, I, I I was that that was also my impression because his his main mission that was given to him was to get those those hard disks. Yeah. Let's just go with that theory. And so anyway, this impresses the guy and uh, he gives them five minutes to escape as far as they can. <laughs> this is, uh, how did you view it? Did, did you feel this was uh, kind of a too problematic for the plot or, you know, the guy is crazy, so why not? Uh, to, to, to kind of e- ex- explain my my feelings with with this notion. Oh, and and with with the second half of the film, where I started to be more with the movie, I I I did feel that that the hitman's tendency to 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 capture and let the let his prey go is is kind of forced. But it didn't bother me really because up until the, uh, 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 because by by this far into the movie, I had already gotten up with the fact that. What we are dealing with here, essentially, and I, I do think that this is important for our, our audiences also to understand, is that this technically is a superhero film, or, or, or <laughs> not superhero, but, uh, but a comic book film. This is yeah. kind of a B-grade thriller comic book movie. And that was kind of a... Once I figured that one out, I actually got more into the film, because b- before I, I watched the, uh, t- uh, the Time to Hunt, I, I had gotten all, all this hype, how great this film is, how realistic it is, how action-packed it is. And it's not really any of those things. It's not terribly realistic in any way. Like, like the, the realism goes out of the window pretty far and goes down with the bathwater. And also, there's not that much action in it. So I, for, for, for a long time, I, w- I was kind of a waiting, when, when does the realism kick in? When, when does the hot shit action start? And w- when I finally noticed that what we are dealing with is, is a comic book f- movie, that, uh, in, in, after that, I was more okay and more in line with the movie. And what happens in the movie, the little inconsistencies and, and the, the lacks of realism, they didn't anymore bother me because now I was with the wipe that yeah 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 this, this is this is a pulpy thriller comic book film yeah this is uh this is something that we tackle in this podcast uh, every now and then for example we have films like moonraker <laughs> the question is whether you want to suspend your disbelief or whether you don't or i don't know it's just, it's always kind of a hard edge to dance on but I guess you can, everybody kind of understands you have to suspend your disbelief when you're watching something like Moonraker. But the second question then is, was it entertaining while you did suspend it or not? I, yeah, yeah. And, and because of this, I am emphasizing the fact that, that this is a comic book film. Because yeah. a lot of the reviews I came up with were emphasizing realism and, and the action-heavy nature of, of the film, which give, in my opinion, all, all that hype gives you, as an audience member, all that hype gives you the wrong impression of the film. It, it kind of, a, it, 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 it fuels you not to su- suspend your disbelief when it comes to the film. It, it kind of a primes you to be more with this, yeah, this could be realistic notion. And that's actually harmful with this film's case. And be- because of that, I-, I would actually recommend it. That w- when you start, when you-, when you come to this movie, you know, just, just let all that hype go. Just, just forget it. Yeah. And-, and just, you know, approach this as, li- like I said, as a comic book film. And 
with that notion, you can actually suspend your disbelief and and you can enjoy the film a hell of a lot more. I enjoyed Time to Hunt much more on my second viewing when I was already figured out what type of film this is. I was really kind of against the movie or, or during my first go because I, I was still caught up with, with all, all the hype nonsense and I was just e- expecting like when does the hype pay off. Okay, so so you took this kind of approach. You read about some, read something about the film before you watched it. For my case, I seem to be really lucky lately because I just pick some movies and I don't research anything. I just jump into them. I don't usually even watch trailers because there are you know tra- trailers of these days are kind of a shit show anyway. They rely on these same uh, visual tactics over and over again. But yeah. Anyway, so I. That's probably why this film hit like a hundred volts when it's when it kicked into gear because I had no knowledge of the film whatsoever when I jumped into it. Yeah, yeah, could be, and I'm I'm like uh, I'm the first person to admit that I'm I did myself a disservice. That happens. Okay, so they go out of the car lot and they get to the car escape scene. Gihun wakes up after suffering a bit of a head trauma. There, Chang Ho is hurt. They get to the hospital yard and there's a close-up on a security cam. We don't know yet exactly why, but but we will know that when Han's police car seems to be capturing everything. In the hospital, there's three guys now with vests and one guy injured. They arrive at the, at the hospital of what seems to be a staff of two in total. And this is understandable, of course, if we are in this kind of a dystopian environment. I just have to wonder how these people get paid and if they get paid in one and all these things that got uh, started to kind of disturb me and yeah this is this is once again one of those moments why i would have wished to to get more info on the nature of the economic collapse that south korea has faced in this film's universe mm, so, well i understand that this country is suffering very much and i can understand why there's some only two people at staff during like late hours if things I... are really that bad as de- beyond desperate as uh, it's suggested i kind of can actually like and and this this is once once again what uh, one point where, where the whole comic book film point comes into play because what, what, also with the hospital scene you kind of have to suspend your disbelief a hell of a lot mm-hmm. because uh like you mentioned, the hospital staff here, when, when the trio bursts in, it's it's a staff of two. The the trio is, is wearing body armor. One of them has been hit what is e- easily to, to deduct to be a gunshot wound from some kind of a high-end magic bullet type of thing. And nobody in the hospital actually sees, sees it important to report the whole schism to the police even though as you mentioned firearms in south korea are extremely rare and hard to get by so gunshot wounds and and stabbings get reported to police by default already for example in finland you would think that same kind of situation would be playing out in south korea also the staff of two is kind of a weird seeing how i don't get the notion that the economic collapse of South Korea in this film would have been of such nature that it would have also train wrecked the, the governmental institutions. For example, cops appear en masse in this film, in, in the one scene where they do appear. They, they come as a group, so, so there's multiple co- police officers to put out on on any given call they also have high-end gear they, their cars look pretty goddamn new pretty goddamn high-end so e- even though south korean economy has collapsed there still is money going on into the governmental public institutions which would also be the hospitals so you would think that there would be more ho- staff on hospital later on when our hitman character gets into the hospital you also notice that now the staff is entirely gone that the hospital is downright silent hill levels of of occupied meaning that there's (laughs) fucking no one there including other patients so you you, (sighs) sure 
Sure. Yeah. It's a very dream like and situation, very haunting. It, it is. It is. It is dream like is is precisely the right word for 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 the scene. Also very kind of a horror movie type of situation. This is this is a Rob Zombie Halloween 2 hospital essentially where you have barely just one person on staff and the killer can just you know walk down the hallways and nobody pays any attention to the dude yeah. and w- once again because of this please when you come into the film suspend your disbelief oh yeah that w- once again that the whole thriller comic book uh, notion with this movie actually helps you a hell of a lot I really, really enjoyed the lighting in this hospital scene. Like, like once, once at least we have, well, you know, if you are a long time listener, listener of this podcast, you know that I love empty, dark and hospitals where nobody's occupying it except just some crazy guy with a scalpel. But anyway, this gives a very Halloween 2-esque lighting. Well, it's not quite there, but... I love that there's a, like a focus on different colors. You have the, the red emergency lights on focus, red and blue colors. It's, it's, it's very dark, but also kind of a hazy. I don't know how they did that, but it's, it's a very hazy lighting, giving it, it is, a very it dreamlike is. feel. It is. It's, it's very heavy. Uh, also, something that I kept thinking a hell of a lot when it came to the visuals of the film and, and the lighting and the sound design was actually Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. I saw a hell of a lot of Batman here with, with, that, with that hazy, oversaturated per, uh, uh, orange that, that gloom, glooms the, uh, the night when they are driving away from the hospital w- with, with the zzz sound that comes from the car. As, as they are driving it, how mm-hmm. how how when, when they they when they start the the, the siren on, on the cop car that they have now stolen, how, how how the light of the sirens kind of gets gets swallowed by by the haze surrounding the car, and even even in the in the blues of the of the hospital scene and the lighting there, there was also I I felt a very strong like dark night vibes coming off. Regarding your earlier earlier comment about the, how it's affecting the state functions as police cars are brand new and they seem to be operating in full force, would it be kind of the situation that South Korea has become a police state and therefore there is less money to throw at hospitals? I... 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 I uh, to me, it appeared that South Korea has become the Detroit of Robocop films, where you have extremely staffed police force, right? like you have the police station that, that has a full staffing, and at the same time you have the rampant criminal rate and shootings happen happening in random car lots. Was... Of, of course, when, when it comes to those random shootings, you only see those in, or hear those in one scene. That's earlier in the film when, when the group is, for the first time, when they are driving was it out of the party just before they mentioned that that the paperweight is now worthless that, that you you are on the on the right end side of the screen you have one flash and and a sound from a, uh, a shotgun shot playing out we have the second dream about sang su get up man he says sang su here to help again and wakes up and wakes up also Gihun and they try to make their escape away from the hospital. Kind of an ingenuity used here. They somehow think of using the cell phone as the trap. They accidentally left it on there, or maybe it was used uh, for a reason. Uh, we of course see that Gihun calls that phone as well to further draw the attention of the of Han. And well, you he should should obviously see that it's a trap, but no. Well, they, they, they have been a bunch of dumbasses up until this point. This is kind of the <laughs> first time when they are really com- coming up with plans and strategies and diversions. So I, I can understand that this one got Han off the guard. The elevator reminds me of kind of Terminator 2. When I, I mean, there's a lot of sh- shooting situations throughout films in elevators, but somehow how the, the elevator gets gets destroyed is kind of calling back on that Terminator 2. 
It is. There, there is also the notion that that our heroes are desperately waiting for the fucking elevator to arrive as the bad guy or of the film is slowly walking towards that same elevator. They get downstairs, take the car of Han, which is conveniently left open. I kept thinking that this is obviously a trap. Like, for example, the cop car is going to have all kinds of surveillance equipment, so Han will just grab his cell phone from his pocket and check where these guys are going. Or maybe it will be full of uh, explosives that he will just somehow trigger. But none of that happens. And th this is what I'm telling you about when I say that this is kind of unpredictable. And then, you know, we find that the guy is actually a policeman. Yeah, I, I'm still unsure. Is he a policeman? Okay. Uh, w w with that, yeah. Granted, Yun Seok makes the notion on the phone to, when he's calling Han that you are a policeman. But that can also be a misconception of Yun Seok based on the fact that Han has been driving a cop car. It could be. It could be. I'm, I'm like, when it comes to Han's nature as, as a cop, what, what I found more interesting is that when Han is leaving the hospital and the police finally are, uh, arrives and they start to arrest Han, Han in no point whatsoever makes any effort to protest against his arrest by stating that he is a police officer. In, instead, the only reason why he's mm. let go, he, he's not let go because of his nature as a cop, he's let go because some faceless higher-up has caught the, the, the chief, chief of police and he tells them to actually let Han go. That's a very good point. Or maybe it's just a kind of a... Well, yeah. It, it, it can, of course, also be the case that, that Han Rui is, is a police officer, but he never actually states it out because super badass hitman. Right. Something like this. You worded it out, worded it out nicely. There is this psychedelic, almost bird view cam with red and, again, this dark, hazy lighting while the car is on the road. And it's uh, kind of a drone shot. Uh, that's nice. They notice uh, it's a police cruiser now. And uh, Han says that you exceeded my expectations. I'm glad I let you leave. It's been fun. And uh, all of these things happening. And he adds that turning yourself in will change nothing. No one will help you. This isn't the world you used to live. No matter where you are, you cannot escape. Uh, so that, that I kind of felt that was suggesting that he is a cop. But then again, who knows? Yeah, uh, whatever the case is, it's never actually made clear. Altogether, what or who Han is, is never established. Now we got to daytime, to the derelict apartments at the harbor city, where they're going to make their escape later. There's a montage of poor people on the way. It's quite well established that the, the, the poorness is all over South Korea. And Junsa calls, supposedly his dealer friend here, and says that even if his dealer friend leaves now to help them out, he will still arrive only at dawn. But he leaves anyway, and there's a secret hideout in this building. There's one padlocked apartment in this derelict uh, building, and which I kind of found really cool. A derelict building that no one will ever visit. I would like one of those rooms, one room with all the comforts within a derelict building. How cool is that? <laughs> yeah, perfect hideout. Except if you, you know, it's full of junkies. ki thinks he can't go with them because of the parents. He just seems to think about it right now. I don't know why, why it's coming to his head right now, but it does. And he's, he's saying that he'll head back alone after seeing his buddies to the boat. And there's a story time about uh, arms dealer's brother. This really small injected piece of uh, plot development. The dead arms dealer's brother knows who killed his brother. And Han doesn't seem to know that he's being tracked. And they are going to attach some kind of a tracker into the into his back even now. And I don't know at what point, but they do that. And this twin brother of this arms dealer is now going to avenge this Han guy, what he has been doing. He didn't really look like a twin brother. Like, or maybe it was played by the same actor, but they looked completely different. Parents on their way back home and they see the men in black at their door. And while at the secret hideout, ki phone is dead, he borrows jang -ho's phone to call his parents, and clearly mom is disturbed by something, and is in tears. We don't see anyone in the room of the mothers. 
it just could be that the father is now dead. That's my theory. And she was left alive and that the thugs are gone at this point because they are not asking anything from the m mother, such as Kihun's location, information, it seems. But it could still be that she's been used as a bait to drag Gihun back to her. Yeah, that was that was my take on 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 the scene. I I took it the way that that the henchmen are hiding just off the camera. But if the thugs have already acquired info from the parents of where they are, well, that could be that they're just heading to the harbor or the derelict place because the the parents knew their plan to travel to Taiwan and maybe it's a good sign that it's not the thugs who initiated the call it was Gihun who made the call of course it could be it could be because Gihun's phone was out maybe they tried to call the guy all in all my theory is leaning to the direction that Gihun is going home and takes the mother with him in the sequel and they are on their way to Taiwan but there's some mishaps on the way <laughs> we will see so um, Gihun leaves his jacket for Chang Ho Gihun is stopped by Jun Sok and Gihun Explain that that he is going away already, but he doesn't want to share the full story. There's some kind of a voiceover. I'll hurry so you won't be lonely. I don't know if it's a voice voice message via phone or what. But Han arrives to the secret hideout, and this is a problematic point in the film because this is essentially a repetition of the of the hospital sequence. Essentially, we have a once again a derelict building where gunfighting happens, firefight in the corridors. <laughs> Yeah, and and this is also once again a sequence that that like like you said, it basically takes place just in a corridor. Like that, they 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 have the entire building, but you don't get. But but where the characters are, they are in in corridor. They are in the same corridor, and and all the shooting happens on this corridor. Once Yun Seok leaves the corridor and ex and enters a room, that's also the moment when he uh, finds a way out of the building, and this way he gains the ability to actually escape Han altogether. Once again, nice false expectations moment. You are expecting that Han will catch them and try to shoot Chun Sok a couple of times when they are exiting through the win window, but never happens. Yeah, I was I, I was actually expecting that as as Chun Sok is escaping through the window, Han will all all of a sudden appear in the corridor and actually shoot Zhang Ho. Mm. You know what I would have much preferred because this is a very similar in spirit to the hospital scene. They could have just left the entire firefight inside this building to the very, very minimum. Just get on with it and get to the street fight, which follows here, where the tension is ratcheted to high heavens, of course. They are trying to escape with the car, but not able to get it running on time. And they change positions at the street. Han shoots Chang Ho, Jun Sok shoots Han. And uh, after getting a couple of bullets into his body, Junso cracks him into safety. And there is the quote, I'm not lonely. He's not lonely anymore. He wants to be alone. Junso gets shot, but not badly enough. And the arms dealers brothers groups interrupt the headshot opportunity of Han. Han is shot in the harbor and falls into the waters. There is no way for this guy to come back. And even if he would come back, he would be absolutely useless for the chase. But yeah, there is a... Uh, you care for these characters in unexpected ways. There is this uh, orphan spiritual brother connection between Chang Ho and Chung Sok. So it's a bit emotional. I think it worked out nicely. And we have a kind of a... I don't know, hasty, but it's a small collection of kind of a montage of things that happens in Taiwan. Jun Sok travels to Taiwan and, and because he made a promise to Chang Ho, whatever happens, he'd go there. He stares at the ocean there, stares at the inhaler. And there's a flashback to the, even if I die, you go. And cries alone in his little bungalow of sorts. He meets his smuggler friend at the beach and he gets a list of people involved with, with that gambling house. The smuggler adds that, uh, quote, he is still alive. I was a bit confused who the hell is still alive. Like, <laughs> we know that Han should be beyond repair, to say the least, but apparently he's talking about the ambush ambush that we just witnessed. Uh, so it's Han. And 
he tells that the arms dealer business has gone to shit, which is uh, not a surprise to anyone, and that the twin brother has mobilized the police to wipe, quote, them out. The same police that let Han go. Great. And Han is not his real name. He uses the name Li Zhe Xin, which is apparently not real enough even yet. <laughs> He's a killer for hire. And there's one more nightmare of Han. He's the shadow man in the bungalow, which is the defining moment. This guy wants to set the score straight and look the guy in the eye and shoot him in between the eyes. He does some shooting training with the glass bottles. The smuggler is in the car. Quote, shouldn't you tell Chun Sok about his friend, the one he's been waiting for? He never asked us to look into him. There's no need to tell him what he didn't ask. Sometimes you need to lie to yourself or you can't endure it. Okay, Henrik, this is one of those false expectations things for sure. This is like, he's most likely talking about Gihun's family and not Gihun, Gihun himself. This could be like a talented cheat here. Gihun should be alive. That's the only thing that makes sense to me uh, as far as it goes for the sequel. And of course, Chusik is too expensive of a, of a character or actor to just kill him off like that. So most likely... The dad died, the mother is still alive, something like that. Yeah, that's that's kind of um, the key question if there is a sequel. Mo most likely, in, in case of a sequel, most likely Kihun is being brought back with, with, with some excuse. But the way how I took it in, in this film, Time to Hunt one maybe <laughs> it is that that they are talking about Kihun and and his family and they are all dead at this point like Kihun returned home after receiving the phone call from his mom and the henchmen were there waiting and now everybody has a bullet in the head yeah of course there this uh, could be supporting your statement when there's uh, the bicycle shop scene because the the vision of Kihun appears in the bicycle shop but I took it as Junsok daydreaming that his friend would be there. Yeah, it's it's well, once again, it's a, it's a case if we have a sequel. Yeah, and yeah, this uh, interesting uh, cinematography kind of supports that this kind of a paradise that they were supposed to go to doesn't look like a paradise. It looks very like it would. It looks very realistic, in fact, kind of throughout the scene that Taiwan is shown as a cloudy, humid. Always at the brink of rain type of thing. Not exactly a paradise. And he heads back. Quote, remember how he said, we'll never escape him. He was right. Even if I'm here or anywhere else, I can never escape from that hell. I'm going back. And some amazing yeah. hero music is going on here. Even if I die, I'll face him once more. I won't run away anymore. I'll fight. That's where I'm supposed to be. Roll credits. And that's how Batman was born. <laughs> Kind of a big cliffhanger, but I can appreciate this because I felt that the first part of the story was adequately told. The guy is not fearful anymore. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I have kind of a mixed feelings about the sequel plating, plating cliffhanger of, of the film. It, 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 it's not uh, something that, that hugely bothers me, but I... <sighs> Maybe would have preferred if Han would have simply just fucking died off once he gets shot like a fucking million times. Like Han, Han shows up like what five magazine worth of of assault, assault weapon, automatic weapon fire, and lives through it. That and and it, it does play off into this whole Han super duper hitman character. Hitman ma Master Hacker co Katana Collector wipe that the character has. So, once again, not a huge deal for me, but it, it, it was... It, it still, it still... Just a little stretch it too far, a bit too thin, then Han also can show up like a Terminator levels of damage. Perhaps this is uh, actually a Terminator. Or there's a twin brother that looks exactly like him and he will take his identity. Oh god, that actually could be something that, <laughs> that would be the plot twist in, in a possible sequel. Yeah. What the hell, we killed you? Some kind e of a... Everybody has a twin brother in, in Time <laughs> to Hunt 2. Uh, e e all, all the characters for the first film just get, get killed off. 
and then it turns out that everybody has a twin brother and and there is a and in 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 the in the basement of some derelict building there's a secret governmental cloning operation going on where they just you know turn out these twin brothers just so that that the population of South Korea would not collapse with their economy, and they also get they get they also also can actually sustain sustain the people because everybody has has gone back into the cannibal cannibalism. Everybody's eating each other, and so they also need that fucking cloning program, so just so that there will be new twin brothers just coming up. <laughs> Looking forward to that. I was a little bit bothered by like, injecting. Maybe so much of the plot where it wasn't necessarily needed, like this uh, whole Han plot. It, there's a lot of injected plot that is not driven into completion in this installment. It's uh, slightly troublesome for this to work as on its own. And the pacing is not perfect here, no. Uh, the, it takes a little bit too long to get into gear. And I feel that there's too much empty space going on in the second, at the end of the second act and the third act, where it is the derelict building that gets to be a kind of a, essentially, as I said, a repetition of the hospital sequence. Yeah, I I noticed it also, but it didn't bother me. Okay, yeah, it's not a big deal. But what I'm really most impressed by the film is the way that it it's able to keep its very tense and absolutely crazily tense atmosphere throughout the film. It suffers a bit maybe on the second watching, but doesn't every film. But on the first watching, it's completely, it's very unforeseeable what what will happen. And I, I enjoyed Time to Hunt. If I can jump into all the, all the, would I recommend this film? I would definitely recommend this film. It's a high octane, very, very high octane, highest film from South Korea with uh, several different influences and styles and uh, genres even. Yeah, if, if we are to to skip the qu- typical quickies and, and just just jump into giving our overall expressions of the film and answering the main question, would we recommend it? Well, in that way, I, I feel that I can maybe best just, you know, concise my, my feelings and opinions or, or with the film. Uh, and they were a really mixed bag for me because when I started to watch this film, and once again I I have to emphasize this was me coming from from all the from the hype that I had experienced before watching the film. So when when I started watching it, I was actually a bit let down by the film, and I was I was wondering where the fuck is is the movie that 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 the hype was promising to me, or, or, or that I felt that the hype was promising to me. And once I managed to get into the whole comic book mentality and approach the movie from that point, it, it actually got, got way better for me. I enjoyed the film a hell of a lot. So my first recommendation to, to everyone thinking should they watch this film is that if you're going to watch Time to, uh, Time to Hunt, the first thing you do is just you know let go of your expectations and 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 w- when it comes to the notions of of heavy action and and realism just you know just suspend all that shit take this as as a kind of a pulpy story not nothing even that that tries to say anything that deep or clever because mm. there, there really is not. I, I didn't find any kind of a deeper, a more grandi or a bigger message from the film, and that's one of the aspects where I really would have wished, truly and deeply, that the nature of the economic uh, economic collapse within South Korea in this film's future would have been more clearly established and explained, and. I feel that that is perhaps the the biggest opportunity that this film misses because this could have been a really critical film of, of a South Korean economy because, uh, and and I was really kind of a I, I wanted the film to do that because I also I'm very critical of South Korean economic model I I I, th- I do think and I, I've said this previously I do think that that's a ticking time bomb just waiting to happen and it would have been great to see a South Korean 
the thriller action film well, that would have actually studied it more deeply. You know what? I felt that this was some kind of a societal statement. Maybe we will still hear about that more when we get uh, Lee on the line. Uh, we were kind of discussing that he could do us a kind of a 10-minute section where he would uh, tell us his views uh, from the South Korean perspective on the film. I think this has something to do the themes of the film w- with the way that South Korea is very strict in uh, in the institutions. That, okay, you need to have a very great uh, education. You have to keep pushing yourself even to the brink of where you are even considering suicide. Then you get the stable work and yada, yada, yada. It's a, the outlook, how you look to others. That's a very important part of the culture. And uh, kind of the time to hunt is the antithesis of this world. It's all about the lost opportunities, the lost uh, directions in life, and kind of everything, all of that has been destroyed by this new economic collapse. For someone to really break it down and what that might mean, we would need somebody who is more knowledgeable about that. Yeah, um, me on the other hand, my main main thing with with, with uh, South Korean economy is, is the fact that the whole economy has been built upon upon these large in the industrial conglomerates, also known as kaiballs. And I myself, I I strongly believe that South Korean kaibol industry is something that is not sustainable. That too many holes that, in in my opinion, are leaking already, and it puts too big of a burden on the sh- sh- shoulders of the kaiballs. And because of that, I I I strongly do believe that that South Korean economy will collapse at some day, perhaps even in in some unforeseeable unfor- near future, if. Unless, unless South Korea can actually do something with, with the current model that they are they are operating on, and I was kind of wishing that, and and even expecting that the movie would have tackled this topic more and, and kind of played played with this aspect more, and I felt that it never actually did, and that's that that is why I was so bummed by the fact that. You are never even told how the economy collapsed in the film's universe, and 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 you are not told if it's if it's hyperinflation or if it's if it's General Motors Flint, Michigan type of situation. Interestingly, the film was indeed filmed in Incheon, which has this uh, Incheon Free Economic Zone consisting of Sondo Chongna and Yon Jong. Uh, these are areas that are heavily foreign invested and and foreign companies in general enterprises from foreign countries are interested in this region and this is a very industrial city kind of a fitting for the film's atmosphere at least with the films 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 theme that that basically the economy and and by default with that the industry has collapsed within south korea it's it's a, there, there is I, I do admit there there is a kind of a sarcastic realm. If anyone is interested in the song that plays in the end credits, it's by Ron. The song is called "Passing By." There was apparently a lot of hard work going into the audio of Time to Hunt. They spent a lot of time implementing Dolby Atmos surround sound, but not a lot of people have this system at home to experience all that the movie is trying to do there. I definitely noticed that they paid attention to the, the music and sound effects. Little White Lies said in reviews, Unfortunately, at 134 minutes, Time to Hunt feels at least half an hour too long. The result is a patchy but hugely entertaining film that would benefit from a nimbler script and more scrupulous edit, while the superfluous Taiwan coda even suggests a sequel is desirable for to the filmmakers. Sometimes it's better to let things lie, end quote. And I... I, I kind of agree with that notion. I I yeah. do feel that it it was a little too long in, in its running time. Maybe it was just you know that that thirty minutes that that got brought up. I also f- I, I don't feel that this film necessarily needs a sequel. 
Mm-hmm. That there are there are blood threads that are left open. There are there are a lot of possibilities of stuff that can happen in the sequel. But do I feel that that I most definitely have to have a sequel to this film? I kinda don't. Like I'm I'm completely satisfied if 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 Time to Hunt is just one off deal. Yeah, kind of kind of the same. I was satisfied enough by the end. South China Morning Post uh, raised into the attention. Uh, the fact that, quote, Time to Hunt is painfully lacking a feminine touch. <laughs> yeah, there's hardly any women. I can rem- uh, remember two women working at the hospital. Yeah, and there, then there's the mom, who yeah. is mom. <laughs> That's true, yeah. There's not li- really a love interest going on at all. No, and and there there really ain't feminine characters at, at all in in this film. Like e- even most of the randos that you meet are just male, male bodyguards, male gamblers. All the main characters are male. Yeah, funny. Could have been a little additional spice to have like a girlfriend as part of the heist or something. Or maybe uh, you know the conflict, conflict where the, the the girlfriend has nothing to do with it, but is thrown into the the whole deal yeah yeah or, or or then have a film about four female robbers who who heist the mafia establishment i i do get it i do get it why that's not the case this is this is very clearly young south korean film star or young south korean star ensemble casting film yeah, like a boy band movie like you said like i said like a boy band film Okay, Lee, great to have you back here. Thank you for having me. Good to see you again as well. How was it for you? Mm, as a Korean person, yeah. Um, very interesting, very interesting. Like, I love the setting, uh, the dystopian setting. But I think it got a little boring after uh, the middle point, you know, when they kept on running away from this guy named Han. Yeah, like, uh, at first it was so refreshing, and, you know, like, uh, because I've never seen a movie like this before uh, from Korea. And yeah, like as the movie progressed, you know, throughout the whole um, two hours and 20 minutes, I think, I started seeing a lot of flaws, parts that could have been improved. Maybe you guys loved it or not. We, we did have opinions about it. Okay. Yeah, well, we, ha- we did have a varied opinions about it, but overall, Henrik liked it and I can see that there are faults in it, but overall, I really enjoyed it. Right. I realized a lot of things, let's say, uh, the death of the characters, it was just really, uh, really shallow. There's not much of a background explanation for each of the characters, nor, um, you know, like uh, the, the environment around the characters, you know, like uh, the society that they're living in. But, you know, like, even though they take really long time establishing the whole thing, they didn't really establish a lot of things, I think. It was a really good try, like a very uh, uh, new try in, in the Korean film. Like I said, Never seen a movie like this before. But thing is, I just didn't see a lot of Korea in the setting, like in the buildings or, uh, you know, there was not, it was not really very Korean, you know, like the, it looked more like uh, Detroit, you know, like a Detroit in, <laughs> I don't know, right now, yeah. obviously. Eric said the exact same thing. But, but... It, it just seems so Americanized. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? You, you know what? I, I, I feel that this is, why it's dystopian if <laughs> it, it has it can't be the same south korea that you have now <laughs> right yeah 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 a, a film that i kind of saw also heavily featured in in kind of the narrative structure of time to hunt was the american film no country for old men where there is kind of a similar type of setting for the story that there is kind of a down on his luck character who comes up with a situation where he can steal ill-gotten dirty money in that film also from mafia and as a result of of that theft he he gets a super hitman after him and the rest of the film is just him running away from the hitman mm. yeah i mean th- that was pretty much it wasn't it like just running away from the hitman who was basically invincible until the end. What about from a linguistic standpoint? Did you find that there was a lot of cursing or some interesting language that was used? Did you find? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, the actors really tried to bring out this, uh, you know, um, bring out uh, the characteristic of those characters that are living in the society. So obviously they're going to smoke a lot, swear a lot, 
Was there anything that you uh, did? You listen to the end credits song? Uh, did you find out what they were list, uh, singing about? Uh, no, nah, I was. I just wanted to finish the movie. So I, as soon as it finished, I just <laughs> stopped watching. <laughs> it, it was a massive disappointment. A massive disappointment because it could have been something really big, you know. Um, mm. One of my kind of obstacles enjoying the film to the absolute fullest was the rep- repetition of the hospital scene in a sense when they get to the derelict buildings and right. they have the same You know, that chase. scene did not make any, uh, make any sense because, <laughs> all right, <laughs> it's a hospital in a very dystopian society, sure, but who the fuck would let a person who's been shot and those guys are still wearing body armors? Right, the, the the kind of a government that is falling apart. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I mean, you know, when there's like gangsters or like uh, you know fighting or whatever, like police were actually responding pretty well. Like uh, they actually caught the Han, even though they had to let him go because of the uh, the higher up, whatever. But yeah, uh, actually, it actually seemed like a functioning society, even though they are trying to make it out to be a very, uh, you know, destroyed society. You know, they they had police officers (laughs) who was quite functioning (laughs) hospital that that works 24-7, you know. (laughs) What kind of a hospital, though, that is uh, working efficiently or normally has only two nurses at the scene and then leave at midnight or something? Mm. You know, Uh, but I would imagine... Maybe, but the problem is they they didn't explain Mm. anything about it, you know. Yeah, so yeah. you're just out there to guess, yeah. You have Maybe to. You just have, you, yeah. you you have, just to, have su- to admit, Kari, that you are in the, in the minority here. <sighs> you have to suspend. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you man. have to. You have sorry. Yeah. You have to suspend your disbelief a bit if we are talking about this <laughs> dystopian or <Wow>. Detroitian <laughs> South Korea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I- imagine it man if you if you were running with two personnel only one hospital one huge ass hospital and there's right. i don't know i think they're just doing it for the benefit of hu- humanity at this point because the one is worth shit now they're just there to help whoever is coming in and they don't even have anesthetics they just pull out the bullet and are like okay right. that's that's it for the so day I- yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but sure. that, that but mate, kinda I... is not the point, for example, with the cops. Be- because the cops still take an enormous risk, risk when they respond to situations. Like, for example, uphanding up- Han at the hospital. That is a tremendous risk for the police force. So I'm fairly certain that, that the governmental institutions, like, for example, police, does not actually work on just on a goodwill of the people and they don't just do it because they like it, they get paid, and at the same way, I'm I'm one hundred percent certain that also the hospital staff gets paid. Because, like, what is the moral of the movie, anyways? Like, did you get anything from the movie, like Curry? Like, uh, what do you the think moral? the moral? Like, uh, what do you think the lesson? The, the Don't fuck up the gangsters. That's... <laughs> the... <laughs> Steve, Steve <clears throat> shit. The, the moral of the movie is that is the enjoyment of seeing Choi Shik, who plays mainly just kind of a cute, nice uh, puppy boy character, and then comes into this film is and is having some fucking tattoo on his neck and uh, smokes cigars yeah. and speaks foul language. I think that was pretty funny, and uh, just kind of speaks of his talents. I I fucking I fucking told you, man. Sorry? I, I, I fucking called it out. I, I, I said that the reason we are checking out this film is because you saw Parasite and was taken by Choi Woo Sik and now we are watching Tan Han simply because of that. Well, there you go. It's partly that, yeah. Yeah, maybe it was a bad idea for you to uh, review this movie with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But let me repeat the question though. Uh, what was the mm. moral of the movie? Like what was the lesson from it? Other than don't fuck with the gangsters in dystopian Korean well, society. Well, don't fuck with the gangsters also was the lesson that yeah. I got from it. They could have stolen something else and most likely the film wouldn't have happened. I don't believe in using moral in every single film and start trying to speak something moral in, in the plot. But I do no, like but, that the, the fact that yeah. the kind of morals are all over the place. You have gangsters who are robbing this place because they need the money. But then again, it's wrong, but it's on the kind of a side of the society. The whole money that they have is illegal. Maybe they could have reflect some of the, the reason issue right now, you know, like uh, the politics in South Korea, what's happening right now, maybe populism, whatever. 
And maybe uh, some of those aspects might have caused the career to be, you know, what it is right now. Or maybe, um, you know, um, a lot of uh, teenagers or a lot of people living in South Korea, they believe, uh, they call Korea this term, uh, hell Joseon, which is hell Korea. Like, uh, you know, this they say this country is a hell. It's so, such a hard place to live in. So yeah, they could have reflect, reflected on that. Well, anyways, uh, one good thing about this movie, though, like, you know, because I was born and raised in South Korea, the Seoul, and I've always seen like that, uh, you know, big buildings, a lot of cars, very busy, good, econom uh, good economy. But then mm -hmm. uh, I realized way before, you know, in school, and but, you know, uh, it reminded me that Korea could have been a, 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 in a lot worse state, like in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Because even mm -hmm. 50 years ago, we were a war and turn country, you know, so it's a miracle that we accomplished so much in, in such a short time, you know, and now we're one of the strongest country in the world, militarily, economically, you know, culturally, even uh, nowadays, Korean culture is just um, kind of spreading all around the world, which is very surprising to see. So yeah, I guess, yeah, I kind of like the fact that it, the movie reminded me that, you know, it could have been a lot worse. I don't know, man. Like, I, th I think uh, the infrastructure in South Korea, they're pretty strong. You know, like, uh, they are very innovating. And we are well prepared for the uh, the fourth industrialization, you know, with the technologies and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. assets that we have with the big corporation because we are, we are big supporters of our corporation in South Korea. But, yeah, uh, anything can happen anytime, you know, with any countries. Like, Venezuela was a very wealthy country, like, 10 years ago. Now, it's gone to shit, you know. Yeah. Like technologically, you are top notch, yeah. and you also are right. pretty damn innovative. I I give that. The biggest right. problem I have with that all of that is that, and correct me here if I'm wrong, but I've m most of the burden of, of being innovative and yeah. and creating innovations on technical fields right. lays lays upon the shoulders of a few chosen companies like the Kaibals. They have to be innovative all the time, and they they are the ones who have to drive the the innovation forward in in South Korean tech. And I kind right. of fear that that's too heavy burden put on too few businesses because there are not that many kaibals in the end in South Korea. It's just the chosen few companies. Oh, but those chosen few companies are very massive. So they are, they are, but they are, but the, w w with the massive nature of the companies, there is also the risk that they might move to a different country or they might collapse. At some point, or and in that mass, case, yeah. because due to a massive nature, that would actually lead into a mass employment because there are like countless right. of workers employed by those companies. Right. So, mm. well, Hendrik, really good point, really interesting. Uh, but yeah, this movie could have been uh, a reminder for Koreans or you know anybody out there in the world that uh, even the South Korea or any country out there in the world might be doing well, but. Anything can happen, so we need to be uh, aware. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I hope you guys are buying gold. Yeah, I'm. Buy now uh, or never. I haven't yet, but definitely need to need to secure my finances mm -hmm. a bit. And yeah, yeah. Swalty are not the strongest currency <laughs> out there. So mm -hmm. no. Curry, do you have any more questions about the movie uh, Time to Hunt, or you know, do you want me to continue bashing on the movie? Or... Yeah, but please continue bashing on the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you would like to handle it. Let it all out. Let it all out. <laughs> yeah. Nah, it's no okay. But yeah, I think I made my point. Uh, it could have been something better, but it didn't. It just uh, became a very cliche. Oh, I mean, very refreshing cliche gangster heist movie. But that was a good try. That's it for me. All right. Well, thanks a lot for tuning in and helping us out in this little session. Mr. Lee. No problem. Favorite performance, uh, Chushik? Yeah, I'm on my end. I'm going to take Park Haeso, who plays Han. Yeah, favorite shot. I would go with the red car filmed from a high altitude. With... Yeah, yeah, I take the same. Yeah, favorite scene, perhaps the highest scene itself. Perhaps the hospital is without. Favorite lines? Uh, sometimes you uh, sometimes you need to lie to yourself or you can't endure it. For me, it was the ironically inserted line delivery voiceover. This is uh, Shushik's character speaking, quote, It feels like a dream that will be there tomorrow, or in two days or whatever. I think there was one saying that it was in two days. Anyway, it feels like a dream that will be there tomorrow. The color of the ocean must be different, right? This voiceover happens when 
Chunsok is on his way to Taiwan on the boat. But three adjectives to describe the film. Tense, adrenaline loaded, beautiful. Uh, mine are stylized because li- like like mentioned it, it, it is. This is heavily stylized film. Uh, the cinematography and and the editing I feel are really great on, on this movie. Also slow as as mentioned, especially the like it, it does get him more interested on, on the second half, but it's it's got, got about hour and fifteen minutes until this this really kicks in the in the gear and also like like mentioned many times already misleading. Yeah, did you look at your watch? No. No. I guess you did recommend this. I I do I I do recommend this. Uh, it's it's not. It, it, it's once again it's it's more more of those those a bit more lukewarm fringe recommendations for my end. I I wasn't really blown away by this film, and I I don't think or I didn't feel that you must definitely have to see this film. But if if you check it out with the right mindset, mind ya, it it can be pretty pretty good time. Technically, this is very well made film. Like like mentioned, the cinematography and the editing, the directing, they they are all really good in 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 this film. There are a lot of great shots, a, ro- a lot of, and and like I also mentioned, it a lot of expectations are misleading you with this movie. So it it is it is it is well made film. Yeah. But I I wasn't completely with it emotionally. It's not the best thing you can see, but it's most definitely it's not not the worst. And it it's on Netflix, so it also doesn't really cost you anything to check it out. Uh, one of those uh, few films that you can actually watch that we're talking about in this podcast, and very easily if you have a Netflix account, yeah. Yeah, you 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 don't have to go to obscure websites to buy. A used VHS copy, like <laughs> like for example, in some cases, like Sucker Cane Alley. Yeah, you really know you're watching Time to Hunt when you're frozen to your seat. Uh, you really know you're watching Time to Hunt when your shoddily planned heist all of a sudden turns into Batman flick, horror film, and a Tarantino movie. <laughs> in closing, next film would be Anshendalu. From 1929, Henrik. An Andalusian dog would be the direct translation. Are you willing to go into classic short film territory once again? Uh, why not? I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of a. I'm, I'm excited to see if, if the shorter episode length actually helps us out in, in the long run. If, if we do become more accessible to our audiences once our episodes don't take fucking seven hours. <laughs> Even we kind of fucked up the, the the a trip to the moon episode because we managed to make it one hour and forty five minutes somehow. <laughs> it, 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 it's it's still it's still on the on the shorter end of of business. Thank God. So this uh, chicken windaloo, uh, excuse me, Anshendalu, classic short film from the early days of cinema, an experimental art piece, co-written actually by Louis. Buñuel and Salvador Dali. It's going to be 21 minutes of bizarre and surreal imagery. So expect very consistent and, and carefully build up, built episode in, in next week. Are we going to be it... just criticizing how nothing makes sense? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't go quite grasp the plot here. <laughs> I, 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 I wish that Dolly would have delved more into the collapse of, of an economic model. Let's try to suspend our disbeliefs also next week, <laughs> to say the least. And to add to the soup, this is one of those short films that are shown in many film schools. So. Uh, also most likely travels around in YouTube. Yep. Thank you for joining us, and if you are missing us all... Ready after finishing this episode, you can go to the social media or, or, or our webpage, as we mentioned, theflicklab.com. Uh, in case you have amnesia, don't forget to leave us a rating 
on Apple Podcasts if you use that platform. If you don't, then go somewhere else to give a rating for us because it will really help us if you didn't figure that out, dear listener. See you next week. Until then. He had a pretty funny fart. P- funny part as the truck driver. Uh, something like that. Badass Hitman. And that's how Batman was born. <laughs> uh, <laughs>